second of four talks I'm giving on the history of intelligence. But let's get the kind of out of the way. Uh, I'll be speaking for uh, 37 and a half minutes, and I'll be very happy to take questions after that. Please feel free to ask questions uh, on any subject relating to security and intelligence, Cold War, First World War, uh, Second World War, whatever. Uh, today I have brought a different bibliography, some we ran out yesterday of the 10 best uh, books on uh, intelligence, so I've got more of those uh, at the back today. And the bibliography today is the worst books on intelligence. Um, for those of you who are lawyers, you're not allowed to read them. So, uh, for those of you who are also interested in chatting afterwards or uh, want to invest in the book, uh, I'll be in the library from 4.30 uh, onwards. So, let's talk about Chinese intelligence. Uh, and it, it's a fascinating subject to study, particularly because it's such a modern concept. Uh, it was President Nixon who opened up Mao's China to the Western world. And I'm actually reminded uh, in 1975 of the very first scheduled flights that went into Beijing. And at that time, the pilots and the air crew who went into Beijing were given the usual Eastern European warnings about how to behave, about the possibilities of entrapment, about honey traps, uh, about the likelihood that the hotel rooms that they would be assigned would be wired for wire, what would be wired not just for audio, perhaps for video as well. There's a famous story uh, of the two Han An pilots who had been given sort of classic uh, Eastern European briefing. They flew into Beijing and they stayed at the Beijing hotel and they noticed, just as they had been told by the security briefing, that Westerners were usually put on the same group of rooms on exactly the same floor. And the first time that they stayed there, they couldn't resist, after dinner, going into one of the pilot's rooms and tearing it apart to find the listening device. And they put behind all the pictures as James Bond did. Uh, they dismantled the television, which was a fairly primitive TV, uh, but they couldn't find any extraneous wiring or circuits in the TV. And then finally, they rolled up the carpet, and sure enough, under the carpet, they found this very large steel plate with a big cable running into it and four big bolts. And they decided that if they ever came back to Beijing, and if they were ever assigned exactly the same room, uh, that they would bring a small adjustable span to be able to attack the listening device. A month later, uh, they were in, uh, one of the pilots got the same room. They came equipped this time, they rolled up the carpet and they went to work on this steel plate. And there were four bolts on the, the steel plate. Big electrical cable going into it. And they reckoned that they were onto an absolute certainty. And three of the bolts came away really very easily indeed. Bit of work, but it was taking a fourth bolt. It was really tough. It took them about 15 minutes to prise it around. And eventually it came away. Now, for those of you who stayed in the Beijing Hotel, you may have heard of the famous occasion in the dining room when the chandelier collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> I know why. So, uh, my purpose in telling you that story is that the Ministry of State Security, which is arguably the largest intelligence agency in the world, and the intelligence agency about which we know the least in the West, is a very remarkable uh, topic for study. Uh, we know a certain amount about the Ministry of State Security uh, from defectors and from recent espionage cases. And what makes the Ministry of State Security worthy of study is that it operates in a completely different way to conventional intelligence agencies. Under normal circumstances, if you take the British or the American or the uh, Soviet or Russian model, uh, there will be stations overseas that will usually be operating under diplomatic cover, and uh, 
the issue for the host community, the security apparatus, is to try and identify the order of battle, try and work out who the genuine diplomats are, and who are the professional intelligence officers operating under diplomatic cover. And that's a matter of surveillance, it's a matter of physical surveillance on the individual targets, it's a matter of electronic uh, and technical surveillance uh, on the premises or the homes uh, of those people that have it. And gradually a picture builds up of the resident hero in the Russian case of the CIA or SIS station, uh, and then you apply your counterintelligence techniques to the targets that you've identified uh, within that particular structure. It doesn't work like that for the Chinese. This is state security. It is enormous, but it does not operate on station bases overseas. So the conventional techniques that we would normally apply to a target hostile intelligence agency simply don't work against Ministry of State Security. MSS has its headquarters in Beijing, but it is also fragmented. It's dispersed in the various different provinces across the People's Republic of China, and each of those provinces will have its own semi-autonomous Ministry of State Security, which will send personnel under diplomatic cover to diplomatic premises uh, in their target countries, but they will not necessarily know each other within, let's say, the Consulate General in San Francisco. They won't know each other. There will be no resident or will be no chief of station or station commander in the British model. So that the way of approaching the Ministry of State Security is a very different, difficult one from a Western counterintelligence perspective. Everything about the Chinese, the way that they operate, is really very different indeed. Uh, let me give you an example. They actually have probably about five priority targets. And these are targets that are not really shared by any other uh, Western intelligence organization. But priorities for intelligence collection the Ministry of State Security is, first of all, uh, in no particular order, uh, Taiwan, national, nationalist Chinese, uh, the KMT, uh, they become a very significant problem. And that is a reflection of the fact that the Ministry of State Security was originally based on the old KGB, which did not protect the interests of the Soviet Union, but protected the interests of the party. The KGB was the sword and shield of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in exactly the same way. Ministry of State Security's sole responsibility is to the uh, Chinese Communist Party, not to the People's Republic as a whole. And there is a distinction to be made. That's why Taiwan is a major preoccupation for uh, Ministry of State Security, although uh, outsiders looking at the Chinese problem would probably not think that Taiwan pose much of a threat to the PRC. Similarly, Tibet is a major preoccupation for the Ministry of State Security. A large proportion of its resources are devoted to undermining uh, Tibet nationalism, Tibet separatism, uh, to studying activists around the world who support uh, the Tibetan cause. Next, very important, uh, but slightly strange target is Falun Gong. For those of you who are not aware of Falun Gong, it's a sort of religious sect. That's the best way of describing it. But if you were to go to a Western intelligence agency like the CIA or the British Secret Intelligence Service and say, um, we're particularly worried about uh, a religious group, uh, unless you could demonstrate that that religious group posed a very serious threat to the stability of the national security of that country, then no intelligence agency, respectable intelligence agency, would give you the time of day and certainly wouldn't devote resources to a religious target. And yet, PRC, Ministry of State Security, regard Falun Gong as a very serious threat to the stability uh, of the regime. Next target, uh, which again is very important to Ministry of State Security, target for surveillance, for harassment, but they don't really care about being subtle about this, is the democracy movement. Anybody supporting the democracy movement or being in contact with the democracy movement overseas, again, is very likely to come uh, onto the radar screen of the Ministry of State Security, and, and they will find all sorts of strange things happen to them, including uh, 
their email account has been hacked uh, and some other hostile activity. It doesn't matter whether you're uh, in Munich or close to any other Chinese emigre group around the world. Uh, if you have contact with the democracy movement, then that means that you'll be in contact with the Ministry of State Security. And the fifth uh, target for Ministry of State Security of the Uyghurs. Uh, this is, these are the, the Muslims in the far west uh, of China, in Guangxi province, who are regarded uh, as uh, a terrorist threat undermining the integrity of the People's Republic of China. And so you can see that there is a pattern emerging that anything that involves separatism, anything that involves divergence from one political norm is likely to attract the attention of the Ministry of State Security. So how does MSS operate? As I described, uh, its internal structure and its external operations are very different to conventional intelligence agencies. Their operations are also very unusual. Under normal circumstances, the Western Intelligence Agency will take a long time to talent spot a particular target. Uh, a lot of investment will be made to try and identify somebody who has access to the kind of information that is a priority for that particular country. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about Russia, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Israel, uh, or the United States. So there will be particular targets that will have been set out uh, and clearly defined and those agencies will try and identify people with access to classified information of the kind that is of interest to that agency. Having cultivated the source, there will then be what is known as the bump, the opportunity to make contact with that individual. And that is a very dangerous moment, because that's where a case officer is going to try and make the pitch, make the recruitment to the agent. It's dangerous both for the potential agent and, of course, the case officer who is likely to show their hand. And then once somebody has been recruited, then, of course, there is the usual routine uh, of managing the agent, which means maybe frequent contact, uh, some kind of sophisticated electronic communication system so as to be able to receive their information and give instructions and questionnaires, perhaps a method of dead drops, to be able to exchange information, pay the agent, and so on. And the Cold War tells us that the best agents are self-recruited, and generally speaking, you can say that these are people with problems in their lives, they're divorcees, short of money, they're gamblers who've had a, a run of bad luck, and they will regard their access to classified information as like a bank account like an alternative, they know they can go into an Eastern Bloc embassy and sell that classified information for $40,000 or $50,000 cash, sort of no questions asked. And that's why a lot of NCOs and a lot of people uh, of relatively low rank but with access to high quality information tend to betray uh, information. And historically, we can see that that's true. It's not true for the Ministry of State Security. Ministry of State Security do not take what you might describe as a sniper gun approach to identifying a target. Instead of spending a lot of time uh, cultivating a source, talent spotting somebody who has access to classified information, uh, and then making a very elaborate uh, scenario where it's possible to make the pitch, Chinese pitch of the world. They use not a sniper's rifle, but a blunderbuss. They will approach hundreds, sometimes thousands of people and ask for their support. And when I talk about thousands, just bear in mind that there are 300,000 uh, students from the People's Republic of China currently studying today in the United States of America. There are about 30,000 delegations of scientists and other officials who uh, go uh, on visits to the United States, uh, sometimes get access to classified spaces, uh, visit national laboratories, uh, visit uh, computer centers, manufacturing organizations, uh, laboratories where there are proprietary um, formulas uh, under manufacture. So 
the, the number of people who are just visiting the United States, who come from the People's Republic of China, is immense. And it simply has to be recognized that almost all of them will have a relationship with the Ministry of State Security. The ability to travel overseas has a quid pro quo in the PRC, and that is likely to be a relationship with uh, the Ministry of State Security. And then SS had a term, they actually call the recruitment of students um, bottom sinking fish. And again, the idea of recruiting a student as a, as a sort of 19 year old, 18 year old spotty kid uh, as a potential source of information would be ludicrous to any Western intelligence agency. But the Chinese, uh, if anything, they think long term. This is not entirely surprising for a country that 200 years before the birth of Christ that had built 5,000 kilometers of the uh, Great Wall of China. This is a country that thinks long term, is immensely sophisticated, uh, had printed uh, books and documents decades before Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press in Europe. This is a country that invests in the future. And their view is the blunderbuss, blunderbuss approach. Simply pitch thousands of students because one, sooner or later, may get access, may become very valuable, may be useful. And patience is another characteristic of the MSS. They will wait, there's one case in Canada where an agent who had been pitched waited 24 years before being approached again. And again, another idea, uh, another view of how patient the Chinese are, uh, and to give you an indication of how successful they are, uh, many of you will be aware of the bad lapses in security in the CIA and the FBI over the past 25 years. You're probably familiar with the names of Aldrich Ames, uh, Bob Hansen, names of people who have betrayed secrets uh, during uh, and after the Cold War. One name that you won't be familiar with is Larry Wu Tai Ching, who was the longest and arguably the most damaging penetration of the CIA over a period of 32 years. And what makes Larry Wu Tai Ching interesting is that he was the most senior China analyst working for the CIA and he betrayed every secret that passed over his desk over that very long period. And the Chinese unusually paid him quite handsomely. There were only a few cases where the Chinese actually paid their agents. But Larry Wu, 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 uh, Wu Tai Chen is one of them. Part of the reason why his name isn't particularly well known outside the intelligence community is because he committed suicide after he was convicted of espionage, uh, which means that uh, because he died before sentencing, uh, his widow still retains his CIA pension and retains uh, uh, all the funds that he accumulated over those 32 years. And to give you an idea of how sophisticated and the kind of resources that the Ministry of State Security prepared to put into these cases, the FBI were able to trace the case officer who was handling Larry Wu Tai Chin. He turned out to be an ordained, authentic Roman Catholic priest working in Chinatown in uh, Lower Manhattan. And he had ostensibly come from uh, Hong Kong, had taken authentic holy orders, and yet he was a Ministry of State Security professional intelligence officer. And his sole task in the United States was to manage uh, Larry Wu Tai Chin. And again, another characteristic which is quite unusual for when you compare the Western techniques of espionage uh, to the Chinese equivalent. The Chinese, uh, instead of rotating their case officers, they will allow a bond, a friendship to develop between the case officer and the agent. So whereas in the Western model, you will routinely every two or three years change the case officer to get a new fresh pair of eyes looking at the case, probably introduce some 
methods to establish the integrity of the agent, perhaps a polygraph test, uh, bearing me in something uh, just to reassure the new case officer that uh, his agent hasn't gone bad on him, gone bad on him, hasn't become a double agent. Chinese don't do that. They will assign the same case officer who may run for 12 or 15 years exactly the same case. So the Chinese have this very different approach. And that's why it's very hard from a counterintelligence perspective to get a grip on their operations. Their favorite technique, uh, and again, the statistics bear this out, is a pitch ethnic Chinese. They generally only go after ethnic Chinese. And the pitch very often will be quite the guy. Imagine for a moment that you are, uh, let's say, nuclear physicist, you're uh, ethnic Chinese, you're perhaps third generation, uh, you live in uh, Los Alamos and Albuquerque, uh, and you have access to uh, classified information. The pitch will be something like this, and it's very beguiling. There will be some kind of an encounter, uh, the bump, as it's called in the business, and the encounter will be, uh, you are very successful, you are very well educated, uh, you know a great deal about your particular field of science. Presumably you acknowledge the universality, the, the true nature of science, that it should not and cannot be limited by geographical frontiers. And do you not recognize that you owe a debt to your own people? And in particular, you owe something to the Middle Kingdom or the Higher Kingdom, which is what uh, Ministry of State Security and Peace Republic of China refer to their own country as. You have a debt to uh, the Middle Kingdom. Come to the People's Republic of China at our expense uh, and see what the country is like. And you'll be invited, all expenses paid trip, to perhaps some kind of relatively harmless academic conference uh, in some provincial town in it's public. And then the Ministry of State Security won't, won't coerce anybody, won't lean on, on anybody, but what they'll say is we do not want you to do anything that compromises your relationship with the United States government. Ministry of State Security and most uh, Chinese from the PRC do not acknowledge uh, Chinese as being anything other than overseas Chinese. They may be three or four generations born in the United States, but actually they call ABCs, American-born Chinese, they regard them still as owing a loyalty to the Middle Kingdom. And so the scientist is invited to attend or maybe even address this academic conference. There will be perhaps 60 or 200 people in the audience, and then perhaps a pitch will be made in his or her hotel room later on, uh, there will be thanks for his participation, and then a surprise. Do you realize that some of your family live in this province? Or do you realize that some of your um, predecessors, your ancestors, uh, lived in that particular town or village or hamlet? Would you like to visit 